It's my great pleasure to introduce Caroline Chang, who is our speaker today. Um, so yes, so let me talk a little bit about Caroline. Um, she is not a near-death experiencer in the conventional sense, but she had a spontaneous awakening in 2007. Um, and a lot of things have happened since that she's going to share with us. Um, in addition to that, she has she produces and hosts Awake to Oneness Radio and has done that for over eight years. She's also a journalist and a columnist, columnist and she's also written a chapter in the award-winning book, We Touched Heaven. Um, so um, I'd like to just go ahead and hand it over to you, Caroline, and uh, please take it away. Welcome. Thank you, Angie. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Hi, everyone. I love to share. So thank you so much for having me. I think a lot of, I'm going to give a PowerPoint and may ask, um, please, if you have any questions at the end of this PowerPoint, please, um, please, I, I love answering questions. That's my favorite thing to do. So I'm going to go now to share my screen. Click slideshow. Click it again. Okay, here we go. <laughs> All right. So the title of my presentation is The Science of Oneness, Bridging Science and Spirituality. And so my journey in spiritually awakening started actually at a very young age. I didn't realize it, of course, but I've always had a um, strong connection to my higher self, even as a young child. I was sent to Catholic school from K to fifth grade. And I remember, see, my father was very strict. I was born in the early 60s and went to school through the uh, mid 60s. But um, my father said children are to be seen and not heard. So when I was going to Catholic school and the priest was teaching and we had religion every day in Catholic school and the priests were teaching and my something inside of me was like shaking my head. I wasn't physically shaking my head, but it was something inside of me was saying, no, that's not correct. And it was like, it was the dogma of the, the Catholic religion that my inner being was saying no to. But again, I could not speak on it. Um, I couldn't speak to the teachers. I couldn't speak to my parents. My father said children are to be seen, not heard. So I said to myself as a young child, well, when I grow up, I am going to really investigate what truth is because I don't think adults are telling me the truth. And I didn't feel like they were not telling me the truth deliberately at that age. I just felt they didn't know the truth. And my inner being was saying, you know, something totally different. So I always had that strong connection to higher self at a very young age. Then when I, when I was 15 years old, I was introduced to this book called Think and Grow Rich. Now, this was, I, I had my first crush and a, a guy I was interested in was reading this book. And he's like, hey, you should really read this book. And now he was interested in this book because he was interested in making money, okay? I Money has never been a motivation for me, not from day one. I have never been motivated by money, but I, I read it because I had a crush on him and he told me to read it. So I'm reading Think and Grow Rich. Now in reading this book, it introduced me to the idea, to the concept, that our thoughts create our reality. I'd never heard that before. I'm like, huh? So that was my first in introduction to how powerful our thoughts really are. Okay, so for the next 30 years, I would read and study everything I could find on spirituality and metaphysics. And back then, I'm talking like late 70s, 80s, 90s. It wasn't that much, especially in the 80s. It wasn't that much to find, but I did study it and it resonated with me. Meaning what I was reading and studying metaphysically and spiritually sounded true. But I had a feeling that I was missing a major piece 
one piece. And it was, it, it, my higher self was saying, you're missing one thing. I didn't know what that one thing was, but it was saying, you're missing one thing. And I was like, okay. So that one thing, and I realize now it was a spontaneous awakening in 2007. And my spontaneous awakening in 2007 was inspired by a documentary film about quantum physics. I, I had really never even heard of quantum physics. I'm like, what is this all about? What the bleep do we know? And I actually bought both the original and this uh, down the rabbit hole, which really is just the extended version. You really just need, if you want to see everything, just buy down the rabbit hole. It has everything. But um, so when I watched this film, it was an eye opener for me. Um, and it was all about science. Now, there was one statement, one sentence that inspired my spontaneous awakening. And that one sentence was um, mentioned, said by Lynn McTaggart, who has been a guest on my show. Lynn McTaggart, who is a journalist, and she, she's amazing. You should look her up. But she said this one sentence. She said, the biggest problem in the world today is the illusion of separation. And when she said that, something literally woke up inside of me. And it wasn't, it was just, I can't even put it into words. It was a true awakening from within that what she was saying was true. That every, all of humanity's problems come from the fact that we think, we believe, we are separate. Okay, so quantum, I learned about quantum entanglement. Quantum entanglement is meaning that everything, every atom is entangled. Matter of fact, Einstein said, called this spooky action at a distance. Meaning if you, you separate atoms that were once entangled and no matter how the distance doesn't matter, if one of those atoms turns one way, the other atom is going to turn at the same time a different way, the, the opposite way. They're entangled and it doesn't, distance doesn't matter. And all particles, everything is entangled. So we, I learned about the unified field theory, which basically is what I just said. Science has proven, now this is not a theory. Science has proven that everything is interconnected and interdependent. There is no separation. There is only one, and that one is all connected. So it was, so like I said, when she said, when Lynn McCaggart said the biggest problem in the world today is the illusion that we think we're separate. All of our problems stem from that one concept that we think we're separate. Separate. The universal truth of oneness is when you look another person in the eyes and you know that that person is not separate from you and you know that person is not separate from God all that is. My terminology for God is all that is. So that is the truth. When we know it, not just believe it, there's a difference between um, believing and knowing. We'll get into that in a little bit. Um, another key to my awakening happened when I was in seventh grade. When I was in seventh grade science class, we were studying atoms and my science teacher, science teacher said, nothing is truly solid. When he said that, I was like, hmm, what's he, you know, what's he drinking? What's he smoking? You know, what's he talking about? Nothing is truly solid. We know if you put anything under a high powered microscope, what you see are tiny particles moving. We call these particles atoms. We, we, we see that these moving particles are not touching. So 
whatever the piece of wood, whatever it is you have under that microscope, you see it's not solid because the building blocks are not even touching, the atoms are not touching, and they're moving. So that tells us something else too. That tells us that everything has life. Everything has movement. It, it, we think of it as being um, a rock or a piece of wood as being you know, an inanimate object, but it actually has life within it because you put it under a high powered microscope and you will see the moving atoms. Now, later on, I, I learned, not in seventh grade, but later on I learned that an atom is 99.9999% empty space meaning even the building blocks of what we call matter are not even solid. So, and so that is why it really, done, what I understood more once 2007, when I saw the, the movie, the film, What the Bleep, I understood now more what my science teacher was teaching me in seventh grade. The visible light spectrum, our human eyes, can only detect, with our eyes, we can only detect 0.035% of what is actually around us, what's surrounding me right in this room. I can only detect, with my eyes, 0.35%. This is just, um, the visible light spectrum, and that little sliver towards the middle is what we can see. We can't see gamma rays, we can't see X-rays, we can't see ultraviolet rays, infrared rays, and on and on and on and on. These things we know are around us because instruments can detect them, but our human eyes cannot detect them. Okay, dark matter and dark energy. Okay, if you look up at the night sky, science has proven that 74% is dark energy, we can't see. 22% is dark matter, we can't see. Um, then there are gases, uh, intergalactic gases is 3.6%. What we can actually physically see with our eyes are the stars and the planets and, and things of that nature is 0.4%. Again, it kind of goes in alignment with what we, I was just talking about, about the visible light spectrum. So there's so much we cannot see. And how many times have you heard a person say, if I can't see it, I don't believe it exists. So if a person says, I, if I can't see it, I don't believe it exists. That means they're saying that 99.96% of what is actually around you, you don't believe exists. And this is science, okay? Now, again, I'm gonna go back to our human senses. Our human senses, we have five human senses, sight, hearing, taste, touch, smell. With our five senses, now I, we talked about sight before, but now if we put all the senses, all five human senses, science is saying we can detect maybe 0.4% of what is actually around us with our five senses. So again, that just goes back to, if I can't hear it, if I can't see it, I can't touch it, taste it, I don't believe. And that's, you know, so many people live by that. So many people live in this bubble of human senses and they don't believe it unless they can verify it with their five senses, which, they can't, it's not, it's not, our bodies are not built to detect that. Now I had mentioned earlier, knowing, there's a big difference between knowing something and believing something. Okay, let's talk about that difference. Okay, when you believe something, you're believing, it's something that you heard, you read, you learned, you studied, and it gets, you know, planted up in the brain. So it comes from the things that you believe comes from your mind. We also call that intelligence. Um, so we, so our, again, our intelligence comes from those five human senses. So we, we store what we learn in our mind and 
that becomes part of our intellect, our intelligence. And we believe much of, we don't believe everything we read, but we believe a lot of what we read and what we, especially what we've learned in school and studied. So knowing, now where knowing comes from a different part of the body. Knowing does not come from the mind. Like I said, when I had my spontaneous awakening in 2007, it came from the center of my being. It came from my heart, it came from my heart and soul. And what I call heart and soul is not intelligence, even though there is there is a thing called heart intelligence. I call it wisdom. So that wisdom is infinite knowing. You ever said to somebody, I just know, I can't explain how I know. I just know. And that come and a knowing cannot be changed. See, now a belief can be changed. A belief that comes from the mind, you can have a belief about something today. And tomorrow you learn something totally new about that same thing and change that belief. Beliefs from the mind can change. Wisdom and knowing from the heart and soul is grounded. It doesn't change. It's infinite knowing where you, where you are connected to a, a higher source. You are connected to your higher self. You are connected to God, all that is. And that connection, you have wisdom. You get wisdom from that heart center all the time. Let's talk about the heart and the mind a little bit more. Because we think, generally we think that our intelligence comes from the mind. Um, there's an organization called HeartMath. If you've never heard of HeartMath, please look them up. They have done a, amazing research into what is called heart intelligence versus mind intelligence. They have determined from their research that your heart is at least 10 10,000 times more intelligent than your mind. And the best thing is when it's called heart and mind coherence. The best thing is when your heart and your mind are in alignment. And that is called heart and mind coherence. Please check out their website, HeartMath. They have done amazing things, amazing research. Again, all science-based. Now, with our limited senses, our extremely limited sense senses, we judge. We judge things bad or good, good or bad. And it's all from our limited human perspective that we are making those judgments. So when we understand that, wait a second, Maybe I don't see the whole picture, or maybe I'm not seeing it the way this other person is seeing it. Maybe I need to listen more. Maybe I, I'm, maybe I still may not agree, but at least listen and hear that other person's perspective. I talk about that a lot on my podcast, is where we don't have to agree with one another, but at least we can love and respect each other because we, when we know that we're all one and we're all one with God and every, everything else on the planet, we can at least listen to what that other person is saying. We don't have to agree, but we can still have respect at the end of the conversation and agree to not agree. You know, we can, we can agree to disagree and we don't always have to judge it and label it bad are good with our limited human senses. So what is oneness? Now, when I launched my podcast over eight years ago, um, <laughs> people asked me, what is this, a new religion? And I was like, no, 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 no. For me, oneness is the exact opposite of a religion. There is no separation in oneness. There, it doesn't matter what your religion is, doesn't matter what your color is, doesn't matter what your, um, your background is, doesn't matter your culture, doesn't matter anything. We are all one, regardless of that. And so um, I personally am not religious. I do not claim to be of any religion, 
but I have respect. I have the utmost respect for all religions. And my only thing is sometimes religion tends to divide us. And um, I, I came out of a meditation years ago and I was meditating and this is even before, I'm trying to, I don't remember the year, but I think it was even before my spontaneous awakening. I'm almost sure it was. And out of, I came out of the meditation and I drew a circle, a big circle. And in the middle, I put love. And, and then I said, all, I drew all these paths to love. And what it said to me, all paths lead to love. So what um, the biggest thing we don't want to do is let anything divide us. So I have respect for everybody's religion. I have respect for everybody's belief, but I'm grounded in universal oneness. Okay, two types, we have two types of collective consciousness. Okay, individually, each one of us has a consciousness and we're connected. So collectively, we have a consciousness. Now for the last eons, for eons, we have been living in what is called separation consciousness. Separation conscious, consciousness brings on war. Now where we're moving to is a higher elevation of consciousness as a higher awareness, which is called unity consciousness, oneness consciousness, meaning that we are all one and we know it. So imagine there are, they say 8 billion people on the planet right now. Imagine if tomorrow morning, all 8 billion people woke up knowing that we were all one. Just woke up and not, oh wait, I'm one with everybody else on the planet. So all I can do is love everybody else on the planet. We would have instantaneous peace on earth if everybody on the planet woke up with that knowing that we are all one. Separation consciousness brings us hunger. Separation consciousness brings us poverty and homelessness. Separation consciousness brings sickness, illness, and disease. Separation consciousness brings crime, mass shootings, and more war. Because we think we're separate, so we, it's okay to go bomb that country. It's okay to go shoot the, those people because we think we're separate. Now, Humanity right now is living at the greatest crossroads ever, 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 ever. I got a download from my higher self in March of 2020. My higher self said, humanity's great awakening has begun. And so that was March of 2020. So we're three years in to the great awakening. And we, humanity, is at a, when I say it's at a crossroads, because we live in a free will universe. And we can choose to awaken to the universal truth of oneness. The key to the fifth dimension is oneness, knowing that we're all one. That's the key to the fifth dimension. And we can, we can awaken, and, and again, it's an internal Thing, and it's something that's going to happen to each person differently. Everybody's on a unique soul journey. But also our soul can choose not to awaken. Our soul can choose. It's free will. Our soul can choose not to awaken and stay with 3D Earth. So right now we are at a crossroad. And I think a lot of people are seeing it in everyday life. We are totally moving in different directions. And never, I mean, I have, I'm not one to say predictions. I didn't think, actually, when my higher self told me in March of 2020, humanity's great awakening has begun. I thought by now we'd be done. <laughs> but the, yeah, I didn't, I'm like three years in it, but I think we're in the midst 
I really do. I think there's going to be a lot of change this year, but I'm never one to make predictions. But I know it's all about wanting to awaken to the truth of who we are. And it's all about love and light. And so once we stay focused on love and light, that's going to take us to the new earth, to the fifth dimension. Um, unity consciousness. Now, we talked about separation consciousness a minute ago. Unity consciousness, in unity consciousness, it's unconditional love, unconditional forgiveness, unconditional acceptance of another person. Now, understand, not talking about condoning bad behavior, not at all. I now I, I recognize everybody as being an aspect of God and an aspect of me, everybody, no matter what they're doing. I don't agree with everything they're doing. I don't condone everything they're doing. I say to myself, I, I take away the judgment and say, they're asleep. They're not awake. They're not awake to unconditional love. They're not awake to unity consciousness. So they're like babies just you know, doing what they're doing unconsciously. And so I have unconditional forgiveness for everyone because I understand what harm they did to another was only because they were unconscious to who they truly are. Now, science has proven that everything is the same energy. So not different energy. We live, everything is energy vibrating at different fre frequencies. So the difference is the vibration. The difference is the frequency. So you can have low frequency, which is a fear and hate and sadness, that's low frequency. And then you have high frequency of unconditional love and um, gratitude and all beauty, all of that is high frequency. Now science has also proven that high frequency, the high frequency of light is 10,000 times more powerful than the low frequency of fear. So I'll, I'll say love and fear, because I believe everything we do, we do either out of love or we do out of fear. And the high frequency of love is 10,000 times more powerful than the low frequency of fear. So in every now moment, we want to try to choose whatever we do from a place of love and not a place of fear. Everything is, okay. I just said, everything is energy, but you know who taught us that over a hundred years ago? Einstein. Quantum physics is over a hundred years old. Uh, did I say that right? Quantum physics, yes, is over 100 years old. And one of the first um, scientists working in the field of quantum physics was Albert Einstein. Einstein said everything is energy and, that all, and that's all there is to it. <laughs> Basically, I love how he said that. Match the frequency of the reality you want and you cannot help but get that reality. He quoted that over a hundred years ago, one of the greatest scientific minds of the 1900s. Now, another great scientific mind of the 1900s was Nikola Tesla. He said, we live in a vibrational universe. Basically, that's just saying we, we're living in an energetic soup. We live in a vibrational universe. And if you want to find the secret of the universe, Think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration. So pretty much the two, and these are two very big scientists from the 1900s. Now your emotions has vibration, has frequency. Now one, this is something I really want everybody to do. I want you to start monitoring your thought process. Because what happens is when you think a negative thought, it leads to another negative thought. Then it leads to another, and you just go, your, your thought process, you're just going down and down and down and down and down till you get to like a place of fear or depression 
are, you know, even get to a place where you feel suicidal, su su suicidal, and I'm one that can speak on that because I have tried to take my life three times. Okay, so I understand that that um, spiral, the um, downward spiral is what I'm trying to say. Downward spiral of your thoughts, and it's your thoughts that are taking you down that spiral. Now you can do the opposite. You can you can think, okay, something positive. Oh, I just heard a beautiful bird sing. Oh, I have a glass of water. Matter of fact, I'm take a, I'm thankful for this bottle of water. You can be so thankful in every now moment for the littlest thing. And you can take that little thing and go up. Oh, I'm thankful I have a house, I have a roof over my head. Oh, I have a car that can get me from point A. I mean, just thoughts that I, my, my neighbors are wonderful. My family are wonderful. My friends are wonderful. There's so many different thoughts we can think that can just raise our frequency. So, and it's all, it all starts with our, our thought process. So one of the things I really like for people to take away from this presentation is to start monitoring their thoughts and just be an observer and witness the thought and ask yourself, is that true? The thought you just had and how does that thought make me feel because how we connect to our higher self our connection to spirit is how we feel so if we're thinking a thought that is not in alignment with our higher self it will bring us down it will lower our frequency if we are thinking a thought that is in alignment with our higher self it'll bring us up, it will bring our vibration up. So that is a, a exercise I would love people to start to do because what I find out just by talking to people, people are habitual thinkers. And even when you try to bring them out of a um, negative thought pattern, it's difficult for them to break that habit. It's something that you have to work on. So everything we everything is a vibrational match so the more we focus on things we don't want my word my definition for the word worry is praying for what you don't want to happen it hasn't happened why are you worrying about it why you know so because what we focus on and this is science not woo woo what we focus on we are bringing closer to us so what we want to do is focus on your dreams, your, your passion, focus on daydream about what you want the world to be, you know, put more energy into what you want to see, not on what you don't want to see, because whatever your focus attention is bringing it closer to you. Quantum physics teaches us who we truly are. We're divine beings of life. I say sovereign. We are sovereign divine beings of light. We are not these bodies. <laughs> we have a body just like we have a car. Our, our body is just a vehicle to get around in this matrix. And so we couldn't, you know, so when we want to come down here and play in the 3D matrix, we take on a body but we are not our body. Our body is no more than our car. You know, it's not who we are. We are a sovereign divine being of light and we're infinite, infinite light is what we are at our core of our being. Quantum physics also teaches us that everything is interconnected and interdependent. Now, I had a scientist on my show one time and he said, if people don't believe in oneness, they shouldn't be able to own a phone, a cell phone, because all of today's technology, all of it, is based on the core principle of quantum physics, which is the core, the core principle of quantum physics is oneness. The core principle of quantum physics is that everything is interconnected and interdependent. Everything is one. 
So that we wouldn't have the cell phone, the smart TVs. We wouldn't have the technology we have today if quantum physics and oneness was not real. Okay, science, which has been teaching us for the past hundred years, ancient wisdom and spirituality are all teaching us the truth, the universal truth of oneness. Spirituality and ancient wisdom has been teaching it for eons. Science is now catching up. Our greatest challenges in life are our greatest blessings. And this is hard for us to understand from our limited human thinking, our limited self. Um, but I'm going to share with you my, my greatest blessings and my greatest challenges, which, again, are the same. My journey with my son, Kyle. Now, I knew I was pregnant. Kyle is my youngest. I, ha I have two children. And Kyle is my youngest. He was born in 1984. And he transitioned from this life experience in, on July 1st, 2014. Now, before Kyle's birth, he told me what to name him in a dream. I knew I was about eight months pregnant. I knew I was having a boy. Didn't know what I was going to name him. But he told me to give him the name Kyle. And I'll explain to you what that name Kyle stands for in a little bit. But Kyle was like, uh, like I said, I only had two children. Kyle was like mommy's, he just wanted to keep me safe all the time. You see in that corner how much bigger he is than I am. He, he was 6'2". He played football in high school. And I am five, one and a half. So he was just a big, he is, he was a big um, gentle giant. That's my, my term for Kyle. Now, I experienced a miracle. It was during Christmas time in 2011. Kyle's birthday is on November 24th. And every few years, Kyle's um, birthday is right on Thanksgiving Day. So in 2011, Kyle, um, well, I, I'll backtrack a little bit. Kyle was diagnosed with congestive heart failure in February of 2011. But on his birthday, which was Thanksgiving Day um, in um, that year, 2011, he went to the hospital. He went to the hospital because he was having trouble breathing. And he was okay when he first got there. But within a few hours, they put him on life support and they medevaced him to Philadelphia. I live in the Poconos, which is about two hours from Philadelphia, but they medevaced him and to um, a Philadelphia hospital, um, one of the top 10 hospitals for heart surgery in the country. He was on life support from his birthday, November 24th to December 14th. So that's about a little over three weeks. And doctors told me that he wasn't going to, now I'll just let you know, this picture is not of my son. I did not take pictures of him at, um, at that time, but this I was a picture I found that reminded me of what I was witnessing because I, I literally lived in his ICU room. I did not move. I lived two hours away. I wasn't going back and forth. I lived in his room. I took better care of him while he was hung than the nurses. I, I mean, but the doctors told me on December 7th that they didn't think my son was going to live. They were asking me if they could take him off life support. They took me out of the room. They do this because they know the patient, they know the patient can hear what's going on. So they took me out of his ICU room to a, a quiet um, waiting room off to the side. And they asked me, could they take him off life support? They didn't think he was going to live. I said, no. I said, no, no, no. Now, this is what I was thinking. At the time, they were saying this to me. 
It's like, and I was awake. I was awake. I knew that I was creating this reality. I knew it. I said, but you know what? This is where I get off the train. I am not, I, I, I told them, no, they could not take Kyle off um, life support. I went to a different floor into the quiet room, a waiting room that I knew was there because I had been living in the hospital now for over three weeks. I knew the hospital. Um, I, the strongest thing I could get my hands on was over-the-counter sleeping pills. I wrote a suicide note. I said, I am not going to bury my son. My son is going to bury me. He needs a new heart. Give him my heart. I tried to commit suicide right there in the hospital, uh, a few floors above where he was. I was unconscious for over three days, or going on three days, over two days, I was unconscious. When I woke up, I was in ICU, not he was in a cardiac ICU unit. So not, I wasn't in the same ICU unit as, as he was. I was in a uh, ICU unit, his, um, doctor, his in internist, was standing at the foot of my bed and said, Kyle needs you. So hearing that, I'm still um, half unconscious, but I heard what the doctor said. I knew Kyle was still here. And I'm thinking to myself, though, I shouldn't be here. But um, in, a, in a very kind aide, nurse's aide whispered to me, don't say that they will commit you. And so I heeded her warning. I didn't say it anymore that I don't want to be here. But anyway, um, so a week after they had told me they wanted to take my son off of life support, I now am a patient in the hospital. They have me on 24-hour suicide watch, meaning they have a nurse aide with me at all time. Even if it's a male nurse's aide, I had to leave the bathroom door open if I was going to the bathroom or if I was taking a shower. I was on 24-hour suicide watch. They allowed me to come visit with Kyle for about an hour a day. And the last time I had that supervised visit, it was December 14th. So a week after they had asked me if they could take him off life support. He's still on life support. I whispered in his ear, I said, Kyle, please get better so we can both go home. That night, Kyle pulled himself off of life support. It was a true medical miracle. The doctors were in shock. He pulled out the ventilator. He pulled out the feeding tube, and his vital signs were perfect. The same doctor that had said to me, Kyle needs you at the foot of my bed, that same doctor said to me, it was like he was never even sick. His vital signs were that perfect. It was a true medical miracle. I write about that in detail in a chapter called We Touch Heaven. And from that miracle, I brought Kyle home on December 30th, 2011, the day before New Year's Eve, I thank God. I said, God, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, but I will never, ever stop thanking you. And I have never stopped thanking God from, the moment, from that moment. And Kyle did transition two and a half years later. Kyle transitioned uh, in the same hospital on life support. This time, I didn't, get a, I didn't get a second miracle, but I was at complete peace when Kyle transitioned. I was at complete peace because I knew it was a soul plan that he and I had made together be, before my birth. I knew it was his soul's time. I believe that it might have been his sole time to go in 2011, but I believe he stayed for me because he knew I had work to do. And he's like, uh, she's not ready for me to leave yet. I'm going to stay a little bit longer for her to get ready. 
And I knew, so, and I knew that he wasn't going anywhere. I knew there was no such thing as death. I knew he would always be with me. I have physical proof. I'll get, I'll, I'll go on. We'll get to that next. Okay. Okay. Like I said, and when Kyle transitioned, I knew I wanted a reading with a medium, but I never looked for one. And I said, I'm not going to, I launched my podcast, Awake to Oneness Radio, six months after Kyle's transition. And a guest of mine's recommended Suzanne Giesman, who you most people in IANS know who Suzanne Giesman is, but this was back in 2016. I never heard of, I didn't know any mediums, didn't know anything about mediumship. Um, but I invited Suzanne to be a guest on my show. After she was a guest on my show in May of 2016, I said to myself, that's the medium I want. And I said to me, I said to her, just put me at the bottom of your list. I want a reading with you. So a week before Kyle's birthday, again, this in 2016, again, Kyle's birthday falls right on Thanksgiving Day. I contacted Suzanne a week before Kyle's birthday. And I said, Suzanne, I am thinking a lot about Kyle. His birthday's coming up next week. And she said, I'm going to do a reading for you on his birthday. I said, Suzanne, that's Thanksgiving Day. I don't want to take you away from your family on Thanksgiving Day. She says, I was instructed. She's also a channel. She was instructed by her channel, her, her guides, I'm sorry, Sanaya. Sanaya instructed her that she was going to do a reading for a mom that has a son in spirit on Thanksgiving Day. Now, she got that message from Sanaya before she got my email. And when she got my email, she knew that I was the one she was going to do that reading for. Now, what happened during that reading was amazing. And it, it, it knocked her socks off and it knocked my socks off. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play some audio files for you. So you're going to hear three different audios. So now we're at the beginning of this reading and Suzanne is inviting Kyle in. We go. And then when we really lock in the connection with him, then you ask him any questions you want. Oh, okay. All right. So here we go. Now, what's that sound all of a sudden? Do you hear it? No. You don't hear it? No. Wow. It was, you'll hear it on the recording. It was this whooshing sound as soon as I said here we go it was really distracting you'll hear it on my audio recording okay okay and here it comes again you guys gotta hold that down wow okay so we're gonna I don't want to be distracted by that so cut that out <laughs> okay that is very distracting though okay here we go it's interesting. I, I don't hear it. You don't hear it. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. So you guys heard that, right? And you heard her say, I will hear it on the recording. You can hear it loud as day on the recording. Live, when she was giving me that reading, we were doing this reading through Zoom. When she was giving me that reading, I could not hear it at all. And that, that um, what you call whooshing, sound is all through the reading, okay? Now here's another portion of that. Now I never told anyone how Kyle exactly transitioned, what caused Kyle to transition. I never told a soul. She could not read that anywhere. Everybody knew that Kyle had a heart problem and Kyle needed a new heart. Everybody knew that, but that wasn't, the, the direct cause of Kyle's transitioning. And I never told a soul. You will hear Kyle tell her in this next video. I mean, in this next audio. That's how that feels. There's a little bit of trouble breathing and the word embolism comes up. Hmm. Okay. <clears throat> and let's go. This feels like a... Um, He's trying to show me some things that may have happened at the end. I don't normally hear embolism, but they may have had some problem with clocks. Yes. 
Yes. You did? Okay. Yes. Wait till yes. you hear this sound. I've never heard it coming through my computer. It's really, it's a vibrational thing. <clears throat> and he says he's doing it. He's messing with the electronics. Well, you can cut it out then. We got you. <laughs> Unless you want to give us some electronic voice, EVP would be awesome. Never heard that. Okay. Oh, wow. Um, I'm... I heard a sound there, it might have been your laugh, but it gave me the image of a very small, white, fluffy dog. I have, don't, mm -hmm. do, you, do you have a fluffy yeah. white dog or you've had one? I had one, I had one, she, okay. she, she's crossed over. Yeah, well, he's holding her like this. And okay. so she's fine, mom. And so am I. He's okay, so in that audio, she said embolism. Kyle, at what caused Kyle's to transition, they did do a, what they call a bridge surgery to try to get him to, he didn't, they, he didn't have a transplant, but they did a bridge surgery to try to get him to, to a position where he could get a transplant. And the surgery went very well. But a week after the surgery, uh, embolism, from being on blood thinners and all of the stuff that was going on with him, an embolism burst in his brain. That is what actually caused him to transition. I never told anyone that. So Kyle told her exactly what caused his transition. And you heard my dog, Coco. You can hear Coco's bark clear as day before she says, I'm seeing a little white dog. You hear the bark. So both Kyle and now in this next audio, you, you have to listen closely. You're going to actually hear my son Kyle's voice from spirit. And just says that he knows that you would do anything to, to, to have him back or you would even be with, just to be with him. But he, he says, you still have a lot of work to do and you're doing it but it also feels like i know he's saying that you feel like you're not doing enough and he says chill out mom okay he you hear there's a spot in there where you actually hear him say doing it and here's the thing suzanne did not hear that two days out when i heard that I emailed Suzanne. I said, Suzanne, listen to the tape right in this spot. When she heard Kyle's voice saying, doing it, she said, holy, I won't repeat it. But in that, see what happened. And she also mentioned electronic voice phenomena, phenomena, EVP, which I had never heard of. So when she had said that during the reading, I had no clue what she was talking about. Now, Suzanne does hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of readings. This is the first time this has happened. It's happened to her, happened since, because I've asked her. Here, you can see me and Suzanne together at IONS Conference in 2019 and in IONS Conference last year in 2022. And, and Suzanne has told me this has happened several times since with her readings, but the first time it ever happened with her where she got EVP and it was spontaneous EVP. She wasn't trying to do EVP. Kyle, my son, and it took, they, people tell me it took a lot of energy for him to do what he did. And it's just, so he's not, he's not gone. He's right here now. I know he is. Um, okay, another um, guest I had on my show, her name is Sonia Rinaldi. She is a uh, Brazilian researcher and she gets images. She gets audio, but also image. She's working on images and audio, but Kyle has come to her. She uses different um, mediums, like, um, like you can see the egg shape. She uses different, um, but Kyle has come to her so many times she puts out an e-magazine, and she featured Kyle in her e-magazine several times. Um, you can see where it, there's a picture of him, but then you can see where he's coming in through the medium that she's using. Now, my favorite, 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 favorite picture of Kyle coming through 
to Sonia was just before I was about to get on a Zoom meeting with Sonia. She had this mist machine behind her head. And she just was recording and had the miss. And, and she always goes through her pixel by pixel by pixel, pix by pix by pix, her videos to see what shows up. Just before I get on a Zoom meeting with Sonia, you can clearly see Kyle in the mist. And she, the thing I have to tell you about Sonia, she does not charge a dime for any of the work she does. She, uh, she does everything on a volunteer and donation basis. And because there are people that try to say that her work is not legit. It is 100% legit. She is, the, she is the salt of the earth. She's amazing. And here um, now, oh, oh, wait. Oh, I thought this was going to be a picture of me with her. You'll see that next. And here, okay, this happened about a year ago. Here's my dog, Coco. In the bottom left-hand corner is my dog, Coco. That's a picture of my dog, Coco. I was helping. One of the things I love to do is mentor parents that have children in spirit. There's a couple in the UK whose son, at 13 years old, he did not wake up. And this happened in February of 2020. Their son just did not wake up. And they were devastated. They contacted me because they knew I... Um, was friends with Sonia, and they wanted they wanted to see their son. So I contacted Sonia for them. And in the first, many images of Wesley came through. But in the first image that came through with Wesley, you see Wesley with a dog. And so Sonia's asking the dad, whose dog is that? And the dad's like, I don't know. And then when I looked at it the next day, that's my Coco. You heard Coco's bark from my reading with Suzanne Giesman. And now Coco is coming through. Now, the reason Coco came through with Wesley is to prove to that father, because he was very skeptical, to prove to the father it was truly Wesley coming through. You have to check out Sonia's work. Sonia Rinaldi, she also did... Um, um, documentary film about her work where I was featured in the film about came out about two years ago but she is amazing and if you guys want any information on how to reach her I can I can tell you how to here is me with um Sonia she's never been at an IONS conference we're gonna work on that because I gotta get Sonia to IONS this is at a conference this is at a we do not we don't die conference in Boston in 2019 we were having so, but Sonia and I are the same height. <laughs> okay. All right. Now, my journey with my daughter Nukia. My daughter Nukia, Nikki is her nickname. Nukia was born on October 26, 1980, and transitioned six months ago, December 5th, 2022. Now, it was very different. Now, both. My two kids were complete opposites, honestly. And my journey with my daughter is very, very different. My daughter passed away in her sleep and it was very unexpected, okay? My daughter though was diagnosed with, two, with, um, diagnosed with MS in 2003. And um, she, she did, she, she's holding my grandson, my one grandchild. She did um, have a baby, um, TJ is born in 2010. So she was diagnosed with MS in 2003. Um, it got worse and worse, but she did go into remission when she was pregnant. So, so say 2010 to the time TJ was about four, my daughter's um, MS went into remission, but her remission actually um, she actually got worse after Kyle transitioned. Okay, Kyle transitioned shortly after my grandson turned four. And she was very, very close to her brother. They were very different, but they were very close. And um, when, he passed, when he transitioned, her um, MS came back with a vengeance. vengeance. And so she struggled um, the last 19 years of her life 
with MS. It was very difficult for her to be a mom. So actually she wasn't married. Um, TJ's dad had custody from the time TJ was like three. Um, but my daughter passed away in her sleep, December 5th, 2022. Again, I was at peace. I knew it was a soul plan. I knew that it was our soul plan for both my children to leave this life experience before me. And I know that like breathing, that's why I'm at peace. I know they're still with me. Um, they're not gone. There, I don't believe there is no such thing as death. And I hope those, cause you're here with, at an IONS group, you guys know that there is no such thing as death. And every soul comes into this life experience and perfect divine timing. And every soul leaves this life experience and perfect divine timing. I always tell people, because people always, when they hear that my children are in spirit, oh, I'm sorry. I always say, don't be sorry. They're still, they're right here with me. They're not gone. And I know that. And I know that I'm still here because I have work to do. And I'm, I'm blessed because now I'm fully awake and I'm living my soul purpose. So my babies are both with me very much. Okay, let's talk about who we are. Who we truly are. We are unique, holographic, multidimensional aspects of God, all that is source. And I want to go into each of those words separately. Unique, holographic, multidimensional. So they're important. Okay. Okay, when I say we're a unique aspect of God, I kind of touched upon this earlier when I was talking about how we could have a different perspective. We are supposed to have different perspectives because we are all unique. No two butterflies are alike. No two snowflakes are alike. No two people are alike, and they're not supposed to be. We're not supposed to be the same. We're supposed to be different. We're supposed to have different skin color, different religion, different everything. We're supposed to be. And it, it, it's the, diff the difference is, is the richness, richness of, our, of life, basically. It's the spice of life. It would be so dull if we were all the same. So it's the, what I try to teach is unity within diversity. Meaning you don't, again, you don't have to agree to recognize that person that you don't agree with. You can adamantly disagree with them, but that person is still, not only is that person a divine aspect of God, that person is a divine aspect of you. There is no separation. So unity, within diversity is so important. Okay, again, I, now, there it is. There's the slide. <laughs> Unity within diversity, again. So it doesn't, doesn't matter your religion. Like I say, I don't claim to be any one religion. I, I have respect for all religions. And culture it are, are, makes us, our culture so rich because we have such diversity within our culture. And that is so important. So what gets me is, okay, what I say is a lot a problem that a lot of humans have, a lot of people have, is I have to be right-itis. Meaning, no, you don't. You don't have to be right. You're right for you, okay? Follow your heart and soul but you should be able to be open up and listen to others, whether you agree with them or not, open up and listen to them and have respect for them, at least respect, if you can't have love and respect. Okay, it's not about being right. It's about being loving, which you are at your core, each one of us. When we fully awaken, we express and shine our love and our light from the core of our being. Okay. Holographic, my favorite quote that will explain 
what holographic means is a quote from Rumi. You are not a drop in the ocean. You are the entire ocean in a drop. You are not a part of God. God. You are all of God in a drop. We live in a holographic universe, meaning the tiniest bit, the tiniest atom, the tiniest cell has the whole universe within it. So you, we think of ourselves as so tiny and insignificant when each one of us is all of God in a drop. Multidimensional. All there is is the now. One of my favorite books, The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle. Even science has proven this. Um, back to um, Einstein, stated time is an illusion. But not only that, more recently, um, the scientist Stephen Hawkins, who passed um, a few years ago, he proved scientifically that all there is is the now. He proved that the now does not only affect the future moment, the now, this now moment also changes what we call the past. There is no future. There is no past. All there is is the now. Everything that can happen, will happen, has happened, is happening in this very now moment. Now is all there is. And the most, most important thing for us to realize about the now moment is that's where our power lies. So many times we regret what we did in the past. Are we worried about what's coming up in the future? We spend most of our time there. People spend most of their time in the past, our future. How much time do you stay in the only moment that there is, is the now. The now moment is your point of power. You can't change what you did in the past. You don't know what's coming up in your future. All you have is this precious, precious, precious now moment. And now in this now moment, you want to do the best. You want to raise your frequency. You want, for me, it's about staying in a state of gratitude in every now moment, knowing that every now moment is a blessing and being thankful and looking for that blessing in every now moment. Your power lies in the now, not the past, not the future, but the now. Okay, science has proven this is recent science as well. Pro science has proven we live in a simulation. Now, I have never, we live in a virtual reality. Science has proven this. We already know that nothing is solid. We don't live in a solid world. Everything is energy. And science has proven, I call it the 3D matrix. We live in, we're living in the 3D matrix. And now they have these things which I've never used. <laughs> These, uh, what do they call it? Virtual reality headsets that you can put on. So we're already living this, what we call reality is already a virtual reality. And then we're gonna put on headsets to go into another virtual reality. And actually the center um, image is of the Apple Vision Pro, which has not even come out yet. It's going to come out in um, 2024. But with the Apple Vision Pro, you do not need a controller. Um, it works from eye movement. It will be controlled by the movement of your eyes, the movement of your hands, not with any controller, and your voice. That is the next level of virtual reality headsets. Like I said, I have never put one on. I don't think I ever want to. Okay. All right. For me, it's escaping the 3D matrix. Okay. 
We're already living in a simulation. We're living in a simulation of our own creation. That's an important piece. We are creating the 3D matrix that we're living in individually and collectively. So we want to take off that headset. We want to know what's really real. So and to and my my um remedy to escape the matrix is take off the headset. Said so take off the headset, take off the blinders, and go within. We want to go within because inside of us is where we are going to awaken to the dream of our own creation. And there's many different ways of going within meditation, spending some alone time in nature. That's me. That's I like to do both. I like to meditate in nature. That is where I really feel closest to higher self, God, all that is. But it's inside of me. I know it's not in this external matrix. I want to wake up in the dream of my own creation. That is what life is about. Waking up in the dream of your own creation. Now we look outside of ourselves for gurus all the time. Okay, what's the next biggest guru that I can go follow or listen to? But the true guru, now I'm not saying listening to other people is a good thing, okay? But only thing the outer world can give you is point you to go within yourself because you are your own guru it is within you. Now, the other people that have awakened can point you to you, but they can't wake you up. Like this, this uh, presentation I'm giving is to inspire you to go within, to wait, because the awakening happens from within, not outside of you. We are all looking for a savior, okay? No one saves us but ourselves. Each one of us, we are our own savior. We are our own guru. We are our own savior. Now, it's great to, to go to conferences, to meet like-minded people, to watch presentation. All these things are great, but to really awaken from inside, it is inner work, not outer work. It's inner work. Okay, true happiness lies within you. I can tell you now, both my babies are in spirit. I know they're not gone. I have very little family or friends around me. I'm pretty much all alone in the world. I am the happiest I've ever been in my life. I'm happy because I have awakened in the dream of my own creation. And now once you awaken in the dream of your own creation, you control the dream. You can raise to that higher level of unconditional love, understanding this is a dream and that it's a dream that you planned before your birth. That's another key. It's so important to own our dream and know that we are not victims of life. We are creators of life. And you can't be a victim of life and a creator of life at the same time. A lot of people say when something good happens, oh, I did that. I made that happen. But if something bad happens, what do you do? You blame somebody else. No, you can't be a victim and a creator. We are all creators. And when we wake up to that truth that we are creating this dream, and the thing I love about Ions, the thing I love about meeting people that have had those near-death experiences, the first thing they realize, it, this is all a dream, you know? And the oneness. They know the oneness, even if they can't put it into words. Once they leave that, that space suit, that, that your body is what I call a spacesuit. When they leave that spacesuit, they feel unconditional love that they cannot even put into words. They feel the connection 
to all that is that they cannot even put into words. That is why when I found ions, I found home. So that, that is pretty much my presentation. I hope I didn't put anybody to sleep. And I know people were probably thinking, uh, I didn't know I was coming to a science class today. <laughs> So that was uh, amazing. Um, sort of part one and part two uh, is how I'm seeing it. Part one, thank you so much for walking us through the science and giving us a sort of a synopsis of uh, quantum physics. That was very helpful. The second, I, was I love sharing it in layman's term. I'm not a scientist. Mm -hmm. A scientist would talk over your head, but I'm sharing. I'm not a scientist, so I'm able to share it in layman's term. Absolutely, absolutely. So your spontaneous awakening in 2007. Mm -hmm. um, 07, yes. Mm -hmm. um, I, I didn't, uh, what specifically happened? I mean, was it a gradual process? Was there something? No, it wasn't. It wasn't gradual. It was instantaneous when I heard one sentence. I was watching, the film is over three hours long, the documentary. Um, what the bleep? What the bleep do we know? Is the title of the documentary. That documentary came out in 04. I watched it in 07. There was one sentence, Lynn McTaggart, and I've gotten a chance to meet her. She's been a guest on my show. She said that one sentence, the biggest problem in the world today is the illusion of separation. When she said that, something woke up inside of me and that I can't even put into words, meaning that's true. That is that just that simple knowing that we are one would solve every single problem on earth. All problems stem from the fact that we think we're separate. Absolutely. And science has proven it. See, now science is new to the table. Ancient wisdom and spirituality has been teaching the truth of oneness for eons. And now science has even proven it. So it was really just that one sentence. That, that one sentence. You about uh, separation. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about, and, and I do want to encourage everybody, please. Um, please come ask questions. Yes, yes. Yeah. Please ask questions. Either put your questions in the chat or raise your hand and, uh, and we'll get to you. Um, so tell us a little bit about you know, your, your personal journey where you've had two children and they've both passed before you, which is not the law of life typically, but you're very uh, self-assured in your sense that this was part of your soul plan with your children. Um, can you, what, what gives you that impression? Have you, you know, what, what has, what brought you to that understanding? Pretty much the, the awakening, because even, okay, I've tried to commit three, suicide three times in my life. I told you about the last time, okay? Um, even when I was trying to take my life, when doctors told me my son wouldn't live in 2011, even at that moment, I knew I was creating this reality. I knew that this was, but I was saying, I know I'm creating this. This is exactly what I was telling myself. I know I'm creating this, but I'm not going through it. I'm getting out of here. That, that is what I basically said. I'm not burying my son. My son is gonna bury me. I'm out of here. I knew, also knew, I'm going to have to go through this again because I didn't finish it this time. So I was like, because you know, suicide is not an escape. I know that. I was like, I'm going to have to, but I'm just, I'm, I, was, I was in that hospital alone. No family, no friends. I was in that hospital alone as they're telling me my son is dying. I went through it twice because the same thing happened in 2014 when he did pass. Still in the hospital for a whole month alone. Okay. So when I say that awakening in 2007, which is hard to put into words, gave me the understanding of life. But even as I had that understanding in 2011, I tried to kill myself. Mm -hmm. You get me? 
So it was that miracle. See, Kyle was helping me there because I think 2011 was one of his exit points. We have more than one. Kyle knew I wasn't ready to do the work I came here to do. And if Kyle had passed in 2011, I may not have never done the work that I'm here to do. Um, Kyle pulled himself off life support. So that miracle, I made a promise to God. So that was the moment. That day I brought him home from the hospital, which was December 30th of 2011. When I made that promise, I said, God, I don't know what's going to happen. Kyle could have passed the next day. I said, I don't know what's going to happen. I will never, ever stop thanking you for allowing me to bring him home this time. And so when he did two and a half years later, when he did actually transition two and a half years later, I was at complete peace. And also, I, I, I know, hopefully you guys have heard of Robert Schwartz, Your Soul's Plan and Your Soul's Gift author. I, while I was in, while Kyle was still alive in 2014, now this is when he transitioned, 2014, I'm living in his ICU room, repeating what I went through in 2011, but I had my laptop and I Googled your soul's plan because I knew it was a soul plan we were having. I'm like, I got to find out more about soul plans. I'm on the computer. I Googled your soul plan. Robert Schwartz books came up. I messaged him. This is before he was that well known. This is back in 2014. I messaged, I went to his website. I sent him an email. He responded right back. I said, I told him I'm in my son's ICU room. I've been through this before. And I had a conversation, a one on one. Robert Schwartz was my first guest on my podcast in 2015. And he's been my guest several times on my podcast. So yes. your soul, I recommend everybody to read those two books, Your Soul's Plan and Your Soul's Gift. That really, he really explains that, yes, everything that happens in our life is a soul plan. I did try to get him uh, for our group, but um, I think at that time he told me that he doesn't work on Sundays. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Well, he, you know, he just did. He just did two iron. He did Hawaiian irons, and okay. he just did just did he, a few weeks ago. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So what? What is? I mean, your children passing before you obviously is a huge lesson for you. So what is it that you believe is your plan? Is your is your purpose? Well, let me, tell, let me say this. I was blessed. I was so, 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 so blessed to be awakened before their transition. I was away even when, when I was going through what I was going through in, tw in 2011, I was away, but wasn't ready. I was like, no, I'm not going through this. But then, so when Kyle did transition in 2014, I was at complete peace. Then my daughter transitioned six months ago I was at complete peace because I knew it was part of the soul plan. And my mission is to help parents that have children in spirit. That's a big part, part of my mission. That's kind of what I was doing with that couple in the UK whose son had transitioned and I connected them with Sonia. I do, I do do mentoring. I always offer the first mentoring session is completely free. Um, but I, the, what I, matter of fact, I know people that mentor and they have said to me, the biggest, the hardest client for them is a parent that has a child in spirit. It's like they can't make headway with that client because they have not gone through it. I had a, um, not, she's not a client, she's more of a friend. I had her and she has a son in spirit who transitioned a few years ago from suicide. She said to me, Caroline, if you have not gone through what I have gone through, I wouldn't be able to listen to a word you say. I know that part of my mission is to mentor parents that have children in spirit. That's a large part of my mission. So I know oneness, awaking people up to who they are, big part, but also mentoring parents that have children in spirit. And so your, your two children who have now passed were in agreement with you, presumably before you were incarnated into this lifetime. So some time ago, before they even came into this world, 
Yes. With the agreement that they would both pass before you did so that you then could do the work of helping a lot of bereaved parents. Yes. Um, that's okay. a very no. Yeah. A very yes. no and word. here's the thing. We still think linear. What did I say about time? Time is an illusion. Time is real. It's all now. Meaning you're saying before my birth, which is true, but it was a soul agreement. We make these soul agreements in the ethers, not in linear time. You get what I'm saying? So yes, but we, as humans, it's okay. As humans, we always want to think in linear time, but if there is no past, there is no future. All there is, is the now. So which, is, which is also mind boggling because. Uh, it's just the whole concept of time I have to wrestle with. But of course, the being present to the now, you can, yes. um, I mean, even just emotionally, if you're not thinking about the past and thinking about the future, you're really focused here, which means you can be present for the magic of whatever's unfolding at any given moment, right? I think often we miss things because we're just mired in the past or we're thinking to the future and we're sort of missing everything that's here. And uh, I think a lot of people go through life and then they suddenly hit a certain, you know, an elderly age and think, what, what, what did I do with my life? I really wasn't present. I was way in the past or I was focused on the future. I wasn't really in the magic of the moment. I missed so much. Um, that's, that's, that that's, is so true. And truly, we can only live in the present. So if we're not in the present moment, we're not living. Right. You know, we can only live in the now moment. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't plan for the future. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean, I planned this with you, what, six months ago? <laughs> so, yes, 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 yes. Remain open, I think, to possibility, doesn't it? Yes. Uh, absolutely. So um, I, was, I could really identify with what you were saying earlier about paying attention to your thoughts. I think in therapy, psychology counseling i think the movement is now for people to become very aware of that chatterbox mind because it, it can be very very destructive and we are often playing tapes in our minds that are from programs often from childhood from negative experiences we tend to focus more on the negative than the positive so i really identify with that because a lot of people suffering from anxiety suffering from depression are playing those old programs. And one of the things that I do in my work is to try to make people conscious of what is your thought process? You know, what is your thought diet? Are you, are you, is it, are these junk thoughts that you're having on a constant basis? Because they probably are. Yes. And writing them down, becoming aware of them is the first step to becoming conscious, conscious of what it is so that you can actually change it. Yes. Uh, so one do of the you things I do is journal. I journal a lot, <laughs> a lot, a lot, a lot. So that helps me, yes. And some people like to write, some people don't. I mean, one of the things that I've suggested to people is to just use their phone if they have a smartphone and voice memo, just to record. If they don't want to write things down, I tend to think much more, much quicker than I can actually, much faster than I can actually write. And it gets frustrating that I can't read my writing. So by speaking into something, right. then it again or you can just get it out but yeah i agree so is that some of the work that you do with parents you get them to try to overcome the grief by really how do you well with parents basically because it's all you every each one of them are unique so i have to focus on what they're going through in that now moment but i try everything all the lessons that i just brought together in this powerpoint i bring to them I bring, I share with them, you know, it's the, I share, and the biggest part of it is your child's not gone. Your child is right here. Your child wants you to be happy. Your child does not want those tears. Your child wants you to think of the fun you guys had together. And your child wants you to know every parent, never, this goes for everybody, whether you're a parent, all loved ones in spirit want you to know they're fine and they want you to be fine because you're here for a mission. If we're still here, we, we have work to do. We're here for a mission and they want us to know life goes, they want us to know life is eternal. They're not gone. They're still with us. They want us to not forget them. And to, but when we, th when we think of them, they want us to think happy thoughts of them. That's what they want. 
how do you um, how do you deal with a parent? Maybe one of the parents is is a believer, is spiritual, but perhaps the other one isn't, and is really having a hard time with this notion that we continue to exist and right. stuck. I mean, they're obviously grieving, but they don't really buy into this notion that we continue on. So it's not necessarily comforting to them. How do you deal with that kind of person? Well, honestly, the only couple I ever worked with was the couple in the UK. And like I said, the father was very skeptical of all this. And that's why my dog, Coco, which I tell you, Coco's right here. Coco came through. Oh, oh, there we go. Coco came through with his son to prove because how the heck they didn't know I had a dog in spirit. And they're like, wait, OK, Caroline put us together with Sonia. Now, our son is coming through with Caroline's dog. How much evidence can you get than that? So that, but that was the only couple, mostly it's moms. Mostly it's moms that I, I mentor. But that, so that was the only couple. So honestly, I don't, and they were, that couple were on the same page. You know, he was more skeptical, but he was open. So you try to suggest, you, you try to bring the notion of evidence into the equation. to Definitely. Try. That's why I played Kyle's voice. Yes. Yes. That's why I played Kyle's voice. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. And what, um, so you, you sense your kids are very much with you. Yes. On the other side. And what is their role now? You know, where are they exactly and what are they dealing with? as far as their continual evolution. Do you have any insight into any of that? I have some in, more insight to Kyle. Kyle, come July 1st of this year, in a few weeks, or in a week, Kyle will be in spirit nine, nine years. It's kind of hard to believe that long. But um, I definitely, I have the evidence from Kyle. Um, Kyle says he's my co-host. He's always with me. Um, he Something about school. Oh, Kyle said to me, mom, no rush. But when it's your time, I'm giving you the tour of, of heaven. You know, he said he's going to give me the tour. And I knew as soon as I heard that my daughter passed, I knew he was right there to greet her, to give her the tour. I haven't had, like I said, both my kids were very, very different when they were here. I'm sure they're very, very different. You know, they were just very, very different. Um, and so I had a closer connection with Kyle. Not that I love both my children the same, but my daughter, once she hit puberty, she's like, mom, you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, mom, you know, but my son, he was always, mom, I'm going to take care of you. Mom, I'm going to take care of you. So it was a different, you know, we had different relationships in the physical. So, and, and my daughter's only been in spirit six months. And it took two years. It took two years after Kyle was in spirit where I got that evidence from him. So not saying, again, no time. <laughs> there is no time. But it's a different, I'm sure that since I had a different relationship with my son here in the physical than my daughter, I'm going to have a different relationship with her in spirit than I have with him. But he's been in spirit in linear time he's been in spirit much longer than she has but he did say something about school so they do i i'm almost sure they have school on the other side hmm. no idea what it is that they're learning necessarily i would think maybe some of this stuff that i just taught <laughs> i think hopefully hopefully <laughs> Um, you told us at the beginning uh, on your slide that you had you've had many deja vu experiences. Yes. Can you speak to that? As a child, when I and when I say when I was okay, when I was as early as I can remember, maybe about two, um, up until maybe about five or six, I would have these these deja vu moments where I was like, "Wow, I did this before. This is you know you know." It was just, it was weird. And the other thing I felt, a couple of things I felt as a child was I didn't belong. I was taught, I was going to Catholic school, so I was taught God does not make mistakes. But I would think to myself, he made a mistake by putting me here because I don't belong here. Yeah, I just, I always felt like I didn't belong. God made a mistake when he put me here. I would have those deja vu moment, moments like, wow, I've done this before. From what I understand, 
a little bit, I don't know a lot about deja vu, but the little bit I understand is like we go through soul planning before we're born. And some, as we're planting our soul, we're going through some of those moments. And when we're especially young, we can remember, wait a second, I did this before because I did it in my soul plan. You get what I'm saying? That's the only thing I kind of get from, the only thing I understand about deja vu, other people might know more about deja vu. I just know I it only happened when I was very young, between the ages of like three and six something like that now one of the concepts i'm jumping around so i hope you don't yeah, that's okay i don't mind it at all please bring your questions guys as well um mm -hmm. one of the concepts that i have problems with is this notion of that the earth is transitioning people talk about it in the new age realm if you will in terms of 3d and 5d it's transitioning it's almost as though there's going to be a physio physical separation um and I don't quite, I can't quite get my brain around that exactly. Could, could you help explain? Maybe other sure, people. Sure, sure, sure. I do. Like I said, I'm a journalist too. And I've written an article recently um, about um, the multiverse. It's called The Many Worlds in the Multiverse. And this is science. And it, say, it basically says everything that can happen does happen in a different frequency. So there could be an earth far worse than this one, okay? That there's plenty of earths. And now, but now humanity is, is and it's, it's shown astrologically, it's shown with the Schumann resonant of the earth. Mother Earth Gaia is a living being and she is raising in frequency. And this, what the times we're, we're living in amazing times. With the times we're living in, have been spoken of by the ancients for eons, the time of humanity's great awakening. We are in the midst, and I got that as a download in 2020. So I, I was like, hey, it's finally here. And basically we choose, do we want, and there's no judgment in this. If a soul decides I need some more 3D playground, I want to play in the in the 3D playground for a little bit longer. I'm not. I don't want to go to 5D. If that's a soul's choice, there's no judgment with that because we all return to the light again. If we don't think of things linear, if we think of everything is now. The majority of us is already in the light. It's just a tiny, 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 tiny portion of us here in this realm. Very tiny. The major, our higher self, which we are is still in, in the higher realm. So when we think of it, so basically I'm thinking there could be many, many versions of 3D Earths and many, many versions of, of 5D Earths and, and everything in between because it's, it's not, it's, and it's, it, and we, it's just everything that we're experiencing is speaking of the, the fact that we are going through humanity right at this moment is going through amazing, amazing changes. Yeah. Uh, uh, oh, I think we have a question. Uh, I think I see two in the or two things in the chat. You see, uh, sorry, go ahead. Now, uh, let me see. I can turn, let me put the chat on. Uh, would you like to ask a question? Um, Mike, could you unmute her, please? Uh, Tanya, were you wanting to ask a question? Yes, great. Okay. okay. Take a second. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else that I'm missing? So who's? Yeah, you're on. I can, I can hear you. Oh, she just muted herself. Oh, no. Uh, you're muted again. I don't know what happened there. You don't have to do anything. Did you mute? Yeah, okay. Now we can hear you. Am I asking a question? Did you have a question? Is it me asking a question or is it somebody else? You. There's only yeah. one. Just okay. You. Okay. You okay. Had... Sorry. All right. <laughs> um, yeah. My question is why is it that we are so limited in our ability to see the world? So you, we see solids when 
there are no solids. But why is it that we can't see things as they really are? Like, very good question. Um, when we choose in spirit, when we choose to have this incarnation, we choose to forget who we truly are. We choose to forget about spirit where we came from. We'll just call it heaven for, for now. We, we choose to forget that we are pure love. We choose to forget that uh, a heaven. We choose to have the experience. We come here to have the experience. So it's kind of like, I love the uh, Shakespeare's quote, all of the world is a stage and all of the people on it are actors. So imagine, it's like we watch movies all the time and the actors are playing really, they're playing their part really, really good. But imagine if they really thought they were that, that person, they could even play that part even better. So we wouldn't have the experience if we remembered everything. It's okay, another way of putting it, God wants to experience everything through us. And to have the experience, we have to go through the am amnesia of knowing who we truly are. But it is the purpose of it. Well, we all have different missions. Like I know part of my mission is to help parents that have children and we all have different, but I think the one mission that we all have to is to wake up in this lifetime, if that's our sole plan, because let me take that back, because not not in not in not in every lifetime is your sole plan to wake up. Because but the thing we is, have infinite lifetimes. But go ahead. But if we're looking at things in the world that are not solid, that's not to do with memory or remembering. It's just our inability to see all these moving atoms in a chair or in a building. So why is it? I mean, I've thought about this before because I've heard this before. Why is it that we see something as solid when it, in fact it isn't? Is it because if we saw all the movement, it would disorientate us and we wouldn't kind of be able to stand uh, balanced on the ground? I don't know. I mean, why is it that we can't see th these things? Okay. Okay, let's go. I'm going to go back to the beginning of it, meaning everything is energy. Okay. And what we do with that energy, we manifest. Like I'm manifesting this chair I'm sitting on. I'm manifesting this desk in front of me. So we take the energy. It's thought. It start, everything starts as a thought and, it, and it's energy. And we take that energy and manifest our dream. It's kind of like, think of it, maybe go back and think of your dreams. It's, it's a dream of your own creation, but in your dream, you want to have a chair to sit on. You want to have food to eat. You want a roof over your head. You want a car to drive. So you're manifesting all this stuff with energy. And yeah, but the not. thing is, the okay. thing is, you're talking about you manifesting that chair and everything, but we're all seeing that chair too. Yes. So it's not like we're all, it's not like we're all seeing the same thing. So we're all seeing the same solid thing. So um, it's not, not it's not, oh, I'm manifesting that chair. It's just, that's what we all see. Now so there, is, some, now here's there some. is something in us that can't see this. Right. Listen to Other. what I'm about to say. There's something, and police have proven this. We don't see everything. No two people see anything exactly the same. None. Police have proven this. They can take five people that witnessed the accident that's standing right next to each other. Those five people saw something completely different. You see, you see the chair, but the way you're seeing the chair is not how I'm seeing the chair. We individually are creating our reality and it's uniquely yours. Your perspective and what you see is, uh, is uniquely you. You know yeah. can see it the way you see it.
Uh, everyone on this meeting now, we we would all be in agreement that you are sitting on a chair. We would all agree on that. We might sort of disagree on the the details of the chair, but we would all be in agreement that you are sitting in a chair. Yes. And that we can and that we cannot see the movement of the chair and the atoms moving. That's what we cannot see. And I want to know why we cannot see that. Can I can I have a Sure. You can have a go at it. Yes, I will do my best. Um, I think Tanya, you know, we buy into this existence. We choose potentially to come here and to have a series of experiences so that we can learn to love and so that we can grow as individuals. And yeah, no, I know that. I know, but uh, 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 that's not my question. But I think that in order for that role to be taken on this existence has to be of a certain type and it does have to be kind of hard. But so my question is, okay, so I buy that. I understand. How is it now that we're waking up to the fact and we're able to look behind the curtain and we can see the wizard of Oz, you know, we're kind of waking up. So, so how come that's happening as part of this experience? Does that, does that recognition and that awakening take us to an even deeper level or higher level of understanding that we wouldn't have if we just remained in the 3D existence? Exactly. So that's the, the question that I have as well. Exactly. I that's I what happened. The, the, the veil, I, I don't know if you heard, the veil is getting thinner between the war, the the veil between this world and the spirit world is getting thinner. That is why Kyle was able, you can hear my son's voice. That is why you can see images of my son. And it's getting thinner and thinner and thinner. I believe when we're fully in 5D, and 5D is here now, but I believe when we're fully in 5D, we can communicate with our love. The way you pick up the phone to call your neighbor, I believe we'll be able to pick up our phone and call our loved ones in spirit. And they're actually working on it. It's called the Soul Phone Project. Um, but yes, the veil is getting thinner. And as the veil gets thinner and thinner, our bodies are changing. Our bodies are changing from carbon-based right now to crystalline, to a lighter body. We will, in 5D, we will not age. In 5D, we will choose to stay there as long as we want or leave when we want. 5D is going to be it's going to be so different than 3D. It's not going to be as solid and, and dense. That's it. The vibration level makes it dense because of the low 3D level vibration. It makes it dense. It makes it appear solid. We know it's not solid, but it appears solid because of the frequency. Now I can, yeah, now I think I got an answer to your question. Um, it's frequency. The higher the level, the ethereal, it becomes ethereal and it, it, it becomes see-through. That's why spirits are, are, are like, we're light beings, we're not solid, but it appears we have a body because the body, but the body is even changing. I mean, so much is happening right now. We live in such an amazing time. I, I do also think it's not just the individual that's creating the reality. I do think that, Tanya, we're all buying into this reality at the same time, so that way we can actually interact. Right. There's a soul agreement. Everything is like this meeting right here is a soul agreement. Yes. So, you know, I think that's why we have the perception that we do. It's a complicated question that you're asking. <laughs> I'm he has the solution. I trust you to come up with a complicated question. But anyway, thank you. Okay. I'm trying to answer it the best I can. <laughs> it's not easy. Yeah. Uh, we're about 10 minutes away from finishing up, so please bring any other questions. Um, your general philosophy of life, then, um, in, in a nutshell, if, if that's possible, is that you know we are energetic beings. We do choose to come here to have an experience on this plane, and there is the, we you know we we are in music. We don't we don't remember, and it's that's part of the plan so that we can really function on this level and be fully invested. Yes, um, and I I think you're right in that you know source has kind of sent us out, and every experience we have I think is recorded the akashic records. Yes idea of the life review and we're sort of bringing it back to source so source can experience it yes 
yes. Because there yes. is no contrast. There is no there is no duality. There it's kind of theoretical. Whereas here, as you get here, you get the practical experience of it, and it's very very different. Right. You must. The, du the duality gets us to decide. You know, if if everything was, if there wasn't the duality, it helps us to decide. You know what? Because it's a free will universe. So we, as God in a drop, decide what we want. But we need to see the contrast. So, do we want that or no? We want that, yes. The only way we could see the difference is through contrast. And um, so, yes, it is. But for me, the nutshell that you said is the oneness. The nutshell is universe. Like I say, and I think about this all the time. If everybody on this planet woke up tomorrow morning, knowing, just imagine what kind of world we would live in. If everybody on the planet woke up tomorrow morning, knowing we were all one and all connected. Imagine how the world would change like that. Absolutely. Let me ask you. Uh, obviously, you know your spirituality is 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 very inspiring, and you're in a very enlightened place. Do you despair for humanity because we seem to be lurching from bad to worse? Mm -hmm. no. So, yeah. I can yeah. just some of the bad stuff that's actually happening. I mean, you just think that that's where it needs to be, and at some point we'll wake up and smell the roses. And I mean, just. Because there is this duality right there. There's this one perspective, and then there's what actually is really happening, which seems to be getting worse. You know, people are getting denser. They're just not wanting to recognize things that are right in front of them. So, you know, what do you do with that? How can you live in both these worlds and still... When you understand it's not real. <laughs> when you understand it's all a dream individually, Individually, like I'm creating my reality dream, me alone, my, what I experience. But co and so individually, we're creating our experience and it's not real. It's a dream of our own creation. And collectively, we are creating the world experience. It's still a dream. Remember I said, science has proven we live in assimilation. It's not real. So when we understand that, no, no soul is ever harmed. Yes, the body, which is like a car. How many cars have you crashed? I, mean, I haven't crashed a lot, but how many cars have you been through? You've been through a lot of cars in this lifetime, right? Do you do you you fret over the car that was just a vehicle? We are going to have hundreds, if not thousands, of lifetimes. This lifetime is just a drop in the bucket, and it is not real. So when you understand it at that soul level, that this is a play, this is a dream, this is a movie of our own creation, you won't get emotionally invested in letting, because when you get emotionally invested, if all the stuff you just said, okay, the war, the hunger, the crime, all of that, not saying I'm not blind to it, I know it's happening, but if I bring my vibration down to that, all I'm doing is adding to that. You understand what I'm saying? I don't want to add to the war, to the crime, to the hate. And I do that if I bring my vibration to that level. If I understand this is a dream of our creation and how I can help raise the entire world and the entire universe, we're each that powerful. I can raise the vibration of this entire world and this entire universe by keeping my vibration high. Do you, do you get what I'm saying? I have this conversation all the time. I just had it earlier today on Facebook. I have this conversation all the time. I, I know what's going on in the world. And I know that everything is happening in perfect divine timing and in perfect divine order. And not one soul is ever harmed. The body, maybe, but the body is fleeting. The body comes and goes. No soul is ever harmed. And I know that each soul 
is creating that reality that they're experiencing for the, just like me, who, what mom would choose from the human perspective to have their children go before them? None. Okay, so I know that was not from my human mind. That was from my higher self and my soul. And, and so that's so that's why I'm saying what I'm saying. It's not like I know what's going on in the world, but I know that well, see, there's so you you ran off of, of stuff that is going on that flip the coin because honestly. There's just as much great things happening right now in the world today. A lot of great, you won't see it on the five o'clock news. Not at all. I stopped watching news in 2001. Have not watched one second of news. And that was my higher self. My higher self told me right after 9-11, turn off, and this is before my awakening in 07. My higher self told me, turn off that news, and never turn it back on right after 9-11. And I said, why? Didn't get an answer for 11 years. That's a whole nother story. But anyway, I have not watched a second of news. I know that the news, they deliberately want to put you in a fear mode. It's deliberate. It's not accidental. Your vibration is the only thing that can save you and this world. That is how strong we are. So if we look and we're like, oh my God, that's happening over there. Oh my God. If we, all we're going to do is add to that low vibration. What do you want to add to? Do you want to add more love to this world or more fear? It's always love or fear. Those are the two choices we have. All right. Well, um, on that note, <laughs> I'd like to, I don't think we have any more questions and we are almost out of time. Uh, I'd like to thank you so very, very much. I love your slides. Uh, they are the best slideshow I've seen ever uh, on this subject. Thank you so very much for joining us today. I know that you're going to be at the conference. Yes, here, I will. Yes. Here in Northern Virginia. Yes. At the end of August, beginning of September. Yes. And Look forward to meeting you in person. Yes. And uh, to let you guys know that my talk, because I did my talk on one on the science of oneness last year at the conference. It won't be on the science of oneness this year. It's going to be how the transitioning of my children inspired me to, because the title of this year is um, into action to inspire something like that. So it's going to be the essence of my talk this year at the conference is going to be how the passing of my children have inspired me to live my life purpose. That's it. Got okay. it. Yes. Yeah. We, we the bleep. Um, where can, where can we watch them? That? The, uh, Amazon. Amazon has it? Uh, Amazon. Look, yes. That's where I got it. I ordered it. I had, I ordered it back in 07 from Amazon. Yes. Okay. Okay. You can see, even if you go to YouTube, you can find clips of it on YouTube. Okay, wonderful. Well, again, thank you so very much for joining us, Carolyn. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. And thank you. Very best. And uh, keep up the good work. Thank and, you. Um, we will see you at the conference before too long. Yes, that's going to be fun. And okay. I just a quick last word to everybody. We um, have our next speaker in July, the middle of July. Please look out for the emails. So it's not going to be the third or fourth. Sunday of the month. It's going to be, I think, the second Sunday of the month. So a little different coming up. But thank you so much, Carolyn. Take care of yourself. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye. See you next time. All righty. Bye-bye.